share what my posts what my post exit uh, strategy has been and became and also lessons learned along the way and I'll keep it brief enough that we can uh, open up for Q&A. Um, in brief, I'm French, uh, though I don't sound French anymore. Um, but basically, I fell in love with uh, computers in 1984, the tender age of 10. It was uh, love at first click, and I knew we were meant to be together forever. Uh, I was one of the top students in France in high school. And when I went to talk at, um, I guess they tried to interview me for Lidna, and they asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, I want to be a tech founder, like uh, my role models, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And they were like, what? You would betray the ideals of the French socialist revolution. And I knew <laughs> there and then that I did not belong in France, and that was under Mitterrand. And so in 92, I went to college when I was 17 at Princeton, I uh, finished off my class, I actually did not study computer science because I felt I knew it already. And uh, graduated top of my class in 96. And you wanted to be a tech founder, but I was 21. I was shy. I was introverted. And so when I worked for McKinsey and Company for a few years, which was kind of like business school, except they pay you. I thought I might miss the bubble doing that, but fortunately didn't. Um, and in 98, I went on to build my first big uh, startup. Uh, I was 23, which was a eBay type company for Europe. It was called Auckland. I raised 63 million in venture money. I, I had 150 employees in the five countries, grew to 10 million a month in sales. I uh, had an amazing uh, $300 million cash offer prior to raising that, all that money from eBay, but fortunately or unfortunately can convince my VCs to take it. Instead, we sold for a billion, which sounds like more, but for stock to a company whose stock promptly fell 99.98% market cap from 10 billion to 30 million during my lockup period. So sadly grabbed victory or defeat from the jaws of, of victory. I went from zero to hero and cover of every magazine back to zero all over again, which led to a brief period of soul searching in 2001 about what I should do next. But I realized, you know, I like building something out of nothing. I didn't do this to make money. I like. I think this is the way to to actually solve the world's problems and harness the deflationary power of technology to make the world a better place, which is both inclusionary and addresses the equality of opportunity. And then with more recent tech, we can address climate change and the mental and physical well-being crisis. And so even though tech was not going to be this big thing, it was not going to be a huge opportunity, this is where I belonged. And so I decided to remain a tech founder. Uh, so probably went on, came back to the U.S., uh, came back to New York to build my second startup with a constraint that it needed to be capital efficient because uh, capital was no longer available. VCs uh, would not fund anything in 2001. Ended up creating a company called Zingy. I didn't particularly like the product of selling, but it was a means to an end. It was a uh, ringtone, so back in 01, 02, 03, 04, 05. And it was extraordinarily tough. Um, I missed payroll 27 times. I invested every last penny I had. I borrowed 100,000 on my credit cards. I lived, I slept in the office in, uh, and showered in the office. I, I lived in New York essentially on $2 a day for almost 18 months, um, but ultimately grabbed victory from the jaws of defeat. And we went from a million in revenues in 02 to 5 million in 03 when we became profitable, You know, building companies the old fashioned way without funding based on profits to 50 in 04 to 200 in 05. Sold that company, the sign for cash to a publicly traded competitor too early, but uh, as we've all learned, uh, too early is better than too late. Um, for 80 million in cash in the summer, uh, in June of 04. Um, and, um, I had about 50% of the company. I I stayed on CEO for 18 months. And it's interesting because at that point in time, it didn't change anything in my life. I think I bought a TV, an Xbox, and a tennis racket, but I still lived in my like tiny, tiny studio apartment because the same way that I'd been working 100 hours a week before, once we became profitable and it started to become a rocket ship, you know, we did one to 200 in revenues in, in four years. We kept hiring, changing offices. I was working day and night. Ultimately left because I didn't like the people I sold it to, uh, even though I liked being publicly traded and being, you know, having to learn section four. Well, I didn't like it. I thought it was an ambition I had, but then realized that being a publicly traded CEO didn't mean the same thing in 2004 or five that it did 20 years earlier when you didn't deal with section 404 and SOX compliance. And so many of you public CEOs out there have kind of realized that the regulatory environment has changed. And so I decided to go back to my first true love, which of course was marketplaces, which is the reason I built uh, the eBay type company to begin with. I, I like create, I like asset light businesses that were winner takes most and that are highly deflationary and that bring liquidity and transparency in opaque fragmented markets. Craigslist had already come of age. 
and was large and, and was larger growing. So I went to try to convince Craig to either let me run Craigslist for free and they create a better user experience because I felt that they were letting down their community, even though they're providing an amazing free public service. And he said no. Then I tried to buy him for a couple billion. He also said no. So I wanted to build my own. Ended up building a company called OLX, which today is the largest classified site in the world. It's 11,000 employees in 30 countries. Uh, none of you have heard of it because even though we are part of the fabric of society and we have 350 million unique visitors a month, we are only big in emerging markets. We're the leading player in Brazil and all of Latin America and Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Romania, and all of Eastern Europe. Well, the Russian asset was kind of stolen recently by Uncle Vladimir, but that's another story. Um, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Philippines, all the Southeast Asia, and uh, UAE and all the Middle East. The company is ginormous. Today's worth, you know, I don't know, at least 10 billion uh, would have been worth probably double that before uh, the Russian asset was stolen and, and, and doing really well. I sold it. Um, so I created that in 2006. I sold it in a complex transaction over three years between 2010, 2013, because I needed about a billion dollars to get it where it was because we had a publicly traded competitor in Europe uh, that was coming after us and spending, and we're investing hundreds of millions in TV in emerging markets, which our American VCs back in the day would not have funded. In 2015, I think a Tiger or um, or a SoftBank might have funded me to do this, but in 2010, it was hard to go and convince my American VCs, which were Founders Fund and General Catalyst and Bustover, to give me hundreds of millions to go spend on TV in Zimbabwe and Pakistan. Um, ultimately sold the company. I stayed for three years after uh, I, uh, they started investing in the company. I won the war with my biggest competitor. We merged 51% for us, 49% for them, and I left in 2013. Now, at that point in time, I was already an investor in 173 companies. Now, while I was CEO of a company, of, of my first company in 98, I started being, by virtue of being a consumer-facing internet CEO, a lot of other founders were approaching me asking if I should if I could invest in their companies. And I thought long and hard, should I do this? And ultimately decided, you know, even though it is somewhat distracting, if I can articulate lessons learned to others, it makes me a better founder. And number two, I'm running a multi-category horizontal site. If I can actually meet all the verticals and understand, keep my fingers on the pulse of the market, it makes me a better founder. So as long as investing in other startups doesn't take more than one hour per startup, then it's okay. And so I decided to only invest in marketplaces and not work in fact businesses. And I created four selection criteria by which I evaluated whether I would invest or not in a one-hour meeting in, in startups. And kind of that took a life of its own, especially after 2004, when I my other exit. And so by 2013, at 173 investments, at 37 exits, was doing very well. And with a friend of mine, really created just a family office. Um, where we were going to invest in startups, we were going to build startups. And in fact, since then, we've built in a studio model over 10 startups, one of which I ran as CEO founder, grew it, became a, another unicorn, sold that, um, never expecting to be a VC. And in 2015, one of the people that had backed my competitor um, in, when I was at OLX said, hey, we now own these different marketplace assets. We'd like to have exposure to what's going on and have visibility and what's going on in the US to bring to emerging markets and to perhaps defend against disruption. Can we be an investor in you? And they actually offered to invest in my, uh, in my family office. I said no, uh, because I, A, I thought it would be, in, in, if I kept raising, it would be infinitely dilutive. So I didn't want to then invest in the operating company or the, the, the GP if you want. So I said, it's said, let's create a GPLP structure. Let's create a fund that you can be a and you can invest in the fund. Created a first fund of 50 million where they were the sole LP, not, of course, not including all the capital I was putting in, in 2016, deployed that uh, by the end of 2017. Then they agreed to do fund two in 2018, raised 175 million from 20 LPs, um, and we finished deploying that in mid-21. And then now we have a fund three, uh, which is 290 million from 50 LPs. And the LPs are either a combination of friends of mine that have been great tech founders, you know, the Reed Hoffmans, the PayPal Mafia, the Kevin Ryans of the world, um, you know, TransferWise founder, Wayfair founder, et cetera. Number two, like family offices being disrupted like tech and three strategics like eBay and actually all the people that have bought my old start startups like Nasper's Process, Adventa, ShiftSet, or Axel Springer, Recruit, et cetera. Now, what's interesting is I'm not a normal VC. I this I would describe what I do as angel investing at venture scale. We 
write small checks. We don't lead, we don't price, we don't take board seats. We invest in every geography, in every industry, at every stage. And we decide in two one-hour meetings using the exact same selection criteria that I defined 25 years ago, whether we invest or not. So every week we get about 300 inbound deals and it's all inbound based on our reputation and brand. A third comes from VCs. A third comes from the founders we've we backed in the past. We've invested in 1,100 startups. That's about 2,000 founders. They come back from the next company. They send us their friends and employees. And about a third comes in cold. We review cold and banned. Deals are randomly assigned to one of the 11 investment team members. And we decide if we take a call or not. We take about 50 calls a week. The other call, the other companies are like, we have enough information to decide that we don't want to look at them right now. They're out of scope. They're too early, too late, too expensive, whatever. We have an investment committee every Tuesday for the, for the new deals for two hours. And then we take a second call with about five to 10 of them every week, let's say seven on average, of which I'm mostly taking. And on the second call, I will decide if we invest or not, basically. Uh, we do the same thing for our portfolio companies. We we have many things that are non-traditional. So we have set sizes per stage. We write 125K pre-seed, 250K seed, 350K A, 550K B. Commitment checks are double. Um, we don't want to be a signal. And we, we treat follow-ons as though we were not existing investors. Knowing what we know now of the team, of the company, of the traction, would we invest at this you ran at this valuation? And very often the answer is no. So we've only followed on in about 33% of the deals historically. And we often sell on the way up. We sell our winners. It's the anti-VC strategy. But because we're price sensitive and we know where the median valuations are, and I'm happy to share what they are uh, later if, if you guys are interested, we, you know, we come in at reasonable or nothing's cheap, but fair valuations. Uh, and if we feel something's overvalued, which typically are the winners, we sell 50% on the way up. Nothing's magical at 50% other than the fact that it's a no regret philosophy. If um, if the company goes to zero, we make 5X or 10X, we're happy. And if it goes to infinity, we sell 50%, we're happy to, to let it ride. In a few cases, we'll sell 75% if we feel it's really outrageous, you know, 100X AR or whatever. Um, we still build companies. I'm currently building a, personally, uh, I mean, it is part of the fund, but I mean, I'm allocating 40% of my time to it, a yield-bearing stable coin uh, to try to replace USDC and USDT backed by USD bills. Uh, we don't have a formal studio program anymore for a variety of reasons, but the returns of the studio were less compelling and less scalable than the returns on the investing side, uh, where to date we've had 1,100 investments, 300 exits. Uh, we've been compounding at 37% IRR for 25 years. Uh, now, of course, more, more of the capital has been deployed in the last six years than prior to that. We've deployed 600 million to date, of which 170 million, 179 million is for my partners and me, mostly for me, over 150 million of personal capital. Um, things I've been pretty beyond what I do professionally in the post exit era, so in 2013. I, I made a lot of iteration. So I, I realized that most people don't bring as much iteration in their personal life as they do to their, their to their business life. And I came to the realization, you know, every, uh, that I saw my friends less often than I would like. And the quality of the relationship has changed because as you get older, your friends become busy. And as a result, instead of like remaking the world the way you did in college, when you see them, it's a biographical update. In the last six weeks since I last saw you, this is what our kids have been up to, my wife, my husband, whatever, my job. And But it's not, it's okay. But it's not the reason we became friends. And so I actually decided to go through a period of extreme iteration wherein I gave all my non-financial possessions to charity in um, late 2012. And I went down to 50 items. Everything I own fit in a carry-on, my backpack, and, and, and my tennis bag. And uh, I decided, okay, to go back from first principles. Because of course, if you have a place to go to, a city in which you live, you just go there. And you don't ask yourself, if I have infinite time and a, an opportunity to do whatever I want and meet whomever I want and be wherever I want, what is it that I really would like to be doing? Where is it I would like to be doing? And who is it I would like to be spending a time with? Um, I threw a lot of spaghetti in the wall, most of which failed, which is also true of startups in general. I started by going couch surfing on friends' couches uh, because I thought the idea was uh, I could 
reconnect with them in a more meaningful way. Now, that failed dramatically because, as Benjamin Franklin said, uh, house gas like fish starts falling after three to four days. And the reason is if you're embedding yourself in their life, but they're not making room for it because they are busy with work and kids and whatever, then it doesn't work. And I have, as you can probably hear, uh, infinite energy. I go to bed very late. I don't sleep very much. And so my vision is like, we're going to, you know, we're going to like play tennis from like 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. We're going to remake the world. <laughs> and, and well, I try to sleep as much as I can in high quality sleep, and, but I am high energy and it wasn't compatible with other people's lives, especially since I was single and, you know, financially independent and which is not the case of most people. Um, iterated a lot to the model where I am today, where because, um, and I was couch surfing at friends' couches, so not, not a real opportunity to meet a wives, but uh, <laughs> um, the, where I ended up uh, today is, is one where I feel that each city, and someone made a comment about like leaving the snow or whatever, each city is a best period to live in. You know, so I live in New York notionally, which means I'm in New York about four and a half months a year. Uh, I think New York is extraordinary in September and October, and it's extraordinary it's like good. April 15 and June 15. But I don't think it's particularly compelling, even though I'm in New York right now, in the summer or in the winter. And so I actually created a distributed life between three core locations where I home a place and I, I rotate between them. Um, I'm... Uh, January, February, typically in Rubble Stoke, British Columbia, where I work from there during the day, but I'm heli skiing, backcountry skiing, et cetera, in the winter. March, I go back to Turks and Caicos, where I'm working during the day, but at night, I'm like reading, writing, meditating, kite surfing, playing tennis, playing paddle, et cetera. And, and then April, uh, May, June, I'm in New York. Ju late June to early July, I go to see my family and friends and niece, uh, visit uncles, aunts, family, cousins, nephews. I mean, I have a ginormous multi-hundred percent family. Um, go back to my birthday for a few weeks in Turks in, in August, then go to Revelstoke in in August uh, to mountain bike, uh, rock climb, et cetera. Again, working during the day, but doing all these activities at night and the weekends. Go to Burning Man every year, and then back to New York, September, October, and then back to Turks, November, December. And for New Year's, usually go to Revelstoke. Uh, I add two weeks to a new exotic location every year. In 2023, for instance, the first two weeks of the year, I walked to the South Pole. Uh, I do a, typically an off-grid category, um, off-grid section every year where I'm completely disconnected, usually alone, either doing, I know I cross Costa Rica on bicycle from the Atlantic to the Pacific with just my backpack, sleeping bag, and tent and, and water filtration system and fin and lint to start a fire. I, and I've done a lot of these types of adventures and I do them regularly, often alone these days with a guide um, in the past alone, alone, but now with a guide, because I'd rather not die, especially now that I'm a father uh, to a two-year-old. Uh, very non-traditional life relationship and, uh, and general setup, but works for me and I'm as happy as can be. Other thing, I know Jonathan uh, from Thum Swanson from Thumbtack presented here, but I've structured my life to only do the things I love doing and not do any of the things I don't like doing. Um, and so I have a virtual assistant in the Philippines, which I pay $1,500 a month, who manages a big chunk of my online life. But more than you can imagine, like if I'm going to play, she'll like, she knows I love tennis, she'll find she'll book pre she'll identify the best clubs find partners my level pre-book the lesson pre-book lessons or, or partners to play with if i'm in new york she'll organize she'll look at all the activities there might be for me to do she knows i like to organize intellectual salons so for instance i'm hosting a post-exit founder dinner tonight with like um uh, six, uh, six uh, well, eight people total. Um, and I host these intellectual salons in New York. I'm going to like whatever magic shows, off Broadway, you name it. And all this can be outsourced. Um, in addition to having an estate manager that manages my offline life, and I outsource things like creating, helping create photo albums, videos, I mean, you name it. I'm happy to go into more detail on how, you know, I have four part time nannies that I've hired because French nannies are going to work more than 20 hours a week, but they, they cover 7.45 a.m. to 7.45 p.m. seven days a week, and they agree between themselves who works when and also who travels when and where. Um, and so I've, I've created an entire system for basically making sure that I live as rich, passionate life as I can and not do anything of the things I don't like. And there are a lot of things I don't like in life. Um, 
I guess from a work-life balance perspective, probably worth mentioning, New York plays the role of intellectual, professional, social, artistic endeavors. But I've come to realize that when you're doing, you're not being thoughtful, you're not being reflective. And so actually, I like that alternation where I go from two months in New York, by the end of which I'm exhausted because you know, it is 24-7, seven days a week, basically, to going to a place like Turks, where even though I'm working during the day, the evenings are really meditating, reading, writing, being healthy, uh, playing tennis, playing paddle, et cetera. Um, yeah. So would not have expected to end where I am, neither from a life setup perspective, three different distributed locations where everything's kind of replicated from an infrastructure perspective, would not have expected to become a VC. Uh, and, and again, I'm a non-traditional VC because I don't lead, I don't price, et cetera. I don't currently have institutional LPs, though that's the objective for fund four, uh, but I'm not changing my strategy. I don't want to change. I, 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 it, it is a reflection of my personal intellectual curiosity. I want to have the flexibility of continuing to be building companies because I think it's fun and interesting, et cetera. I'll pause here. I spoke at a million miles per hour, which is I am prone to, uh, but happy to uh, yeah answer any questions and keep the conversation dialogue going. That was amazing, Fabrice. Thank you for doing that. Um, so first thing, just for everyone, feel free to post questions in the chat. I think we'll prioritize whoever wants to raise their hand, just like Sam just did. I'll come back to you in a second, Sam, but but feel free to keep your hand raised and anybody else that wants to raise their hand in Zoom. Fabrice, just to kind of kick things off, kind of one question for me. Uh, it sounds like you've kind of like tinkered and tried to perfect this model in the post-exit life and you went through different iterations. I think you, you used those words. Uh, if you were going to give advice to a founder who recently went through an exit, what advice would you give them? Well, obviously the, the, the answer is personal, but take time to reflect on what it is you truly love to do. What is it you'd like to allocate your time to? Um, and, and, and what is gonna make you happy? You know, for instance, um, I've come, I came to realize that I've been overworking like probably many of us have and and I love working, but I didn't value or I didn't my, my friends and family as much as I would like to, right? Didn't, and they didn't feel as valued. My grandmother, which had been the matriarch of the family, had uh, used to host all of us at her place for Christmas. Christmas Eve, it was a tradition, like there'd be 20, 30 of us would come there and we'd be organized by age. And she was really the rallying point of the family. And that had kind of gone away after her passing. And I decided once I had the financial means to do that, to restart or rekindle the tradition, for instance. So for now, every year, or sometimes for my birthday, but definitely for Christmas or New Year's, a big chunk of my family comes at my place in Turks and Caicos, I, and I literally, I'll send a jet to pick them up in Nice and bring them over to Turks. I'll find tickets for everyone. I'll rent eight different houses. This Christmas, for instance, or this New Year's, for instance, there's 50 of us, five zero. I came for two weeks and we had a blast. And it's something that I, it does, it takes a lot of work to make happen, but it's something that I valued and prioritized. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here just for a fun photo of uh, the family. I can, uh, let's go to Facebook. Uh, for a second, not common moderation. Doot, doot, doot. Not that Facebook is the best place, but I have that photo handy, so it makes it easier. Oh, yeah, I did post it. Yeah. So this is us, 50 people <laughs> for Christmas, for New Year. Uh, and it goes from my son, who's two and a half, to my uncle back here is 87. And, th and these are, are, I'd say it's the family I have and the family I choose. So it's... Um, it's it's a very it's a very big group and but it's super loving and supportive and it's something that I value. So I'd go to as I said, I'd go to first principles. I see a lot of questions. So Thank maybe you. I'll take I'll take them one one by one. Um do you share the four criteria you used to invest? So that's a question from Michael Cassidy. The answer is I do. Uh, I will actually first put the link in uh, uh, with the, the actual criteria, but I will describe them as well uh, briefly. So wait one second. How FJ Labs evaluated? So I blog, as you can tell, I just wrote my year in review blog posts, uh, which covers professional, personal predictions, et cetera. So th these are the four criteria. The four criteria. Um, so in a one-hour call, I'm trying to evaluate number one. 
do I like the team? And now every, well, I'll give you the four and then I'll go in detail. Do I like the team? Number two, do I like the business? Number three, do I like the deal terms? Or number four, is it in line with my thesis or vision of where the future of humanity is? Now, number one, do I like the team? Every VC in the world will tell you, I only invest in extraordinary people. The thing is, it can't be subjective. It can't be something you know if you see it. And so for us, or for me, I have an explicit sense of what that means for it to be an amazing founder. And I want the Venn diagram intersection of founders that are both extraordinarily eloquent and amazing salespeople, because they're going to raise better capital and hire better terms. They're going to attract better people. They're going to have more BD and more PR. And, but that's not enough, because if you only have that, maybe you don't build a very profitable, stable company. Number two, um, do you, I want founders who know how to ex execute. And the way I tease out in a one-hour call if they can execute is the way they address the question number two. Question number two, which is, is this an attractive business? So it's a combination of total addressable market size, but more importantly, unit economics. Now, I'm mostly seed rather than pre-seed, but even pre-seed, I want the founder to be able to articulate what what they're they, that they've done at landing page analysis that they understand the density of keywords that they know what the CPCs look like how much they can spend per month based on an estimated conversion rate what a CAC looks like and they better know what the average order value in the industry is and what the cost and margin structure looks like and therefore get a sense of LTV to CAC and if they're live well they better be able to articulate what they are and if they're not good and I want I like businesses where you recoup your fully loaded CAC on a CM2 basis in six months and you 3X in 18 months, why it's going to get there with scale. And when founders cannot articulate that, it typically does not lead to, to amazing outcomes from the ability to execute. And so I want both of these things to be true, and I care deeply. It's not all the founder and only the founder. Um, I think Warren Buffett once said, when the reputation of an amazing founder means that of a terrible business, it's typically the reputation of the business that wins. And so founders matter, but the business you're in matters dramatically as well. Uh, number three, deal terms. I know what the median is. The median these days for pre-seed is about uh, uh, you're raising one at four or five pre, pre-seed. Uh, seed, you're doing, if you're a SaaS business, you're doing 30K at MRR. Um, or a marketplace you're one fifty k in GMV, and you're raising three at ten pre, and that's uh or twelve pre. A's these days you're doing hundred k plus in MRR, uh five hundred six seven hundred k in in GMV. You're raising seven at twenty three pre thirty posts, and the B's you're doing five hundred k plus in MRR, or you're raising you're doing two and a half million in GMV, and you're raising fifteen at fifty pre. These valuations. To many appear low, especially people based in Silicon Valley or people that have been investing in the new, new hot trend of the day. Um, but that's because the mean is higher than the median because they're exceptional deals for second time founders that are raising these insane rounds. Uh, but what I've made money on half of my, so I've, I've had 300 exits. I've actually made money on 50% of them, 150 of them, because I came in at a low price. And so even when the company got acquired, I came in at five or 10 and got acquired at 10, for 15 or 20, and I, I did okay. If you come in at a high price, you're priced for perfection. And yes, there are some companies you'd rather be in than not, and you're willing to pay up, but I'd be extraordinarily um, careful. To mix it up, uh, because I only have been answering questions in the chat, I'll take Sam's question, and then I'll go back to the chat. All right, cool, thanks so much. Um... So it's interesting to hear how you've balanced the nanny situation in multiple locations. And it sounds like you have young kids. So have you considered what to do with respect to school? Because this is something that I'm struggling with uh, with my wife um, and figuring out how to do multiple locations in school. So I I have a life partner. Uh, so with the school, uh, and I put the valuation matri matrix in the chat. Uh, for schooling, so we put my, so until now, it's been easy because my, Son was two, so he came with me everywhere, and there was no school. So <laughs> that was the 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 perfect setup. Uh, we decided to put uh, so my a big chunk of my family only speaks French, so the nannies were only French speaking because of course we live in the U.S. or in New York, and and they're going to have English by default. I put my son in a school called the Ecole. The Ecole is a new school. Uh, created by one of the Renaissance um, hedge fund founders and. The philosophy is the rigor of the French system with the creativity 
of the American system, where you have like public speaking and teamwork, et cetera, and you have both an English speaker and a, a French speaker in both class in, in each class, plus a helper to deal with like everything else. So it's three people per class. Um, they have a twos program. My son is in the twos program. And so what I'm changing to my current schedule to make sure I see my son more often is um, I'm with them full time from April 15 to basically November 5, because we spent the summers together and, and I'm in New York then. Instead of going away for two months at a time, now what I'm doing is I make I'm making sure. So we spend all of our vacations together, uh, but he he uh, his mother doesn't travel with me, and we're, and she's a partner at at Kirkland, uh, the law firm. She's working on like IPOs and M and A and and public work. Um, so I I go I make sure that I'm not away for more than two weeks. So I'll go two weeks maybe to Turks alone which I need anyway for reflection, et cetera. And then I'll come back to York to spend uh, a week or two with with them full-time. And again, we don't live together. So we have a non-traditional uh, relationship. We we have a philosophy called living apart together, uh, which probably is worth mentioning it for a second, because I find that if you spend too much time around your partner, you become roommates, as opposed to being really lovers and life partners, and you're not present in every intera iteration, interaction. And, you know, because if we're together, if we live together, you know, maybe I want to be playing video games for a couple hours or I want to be working or whatever, and I'm not present. And so instead, we live separately, though I see my son literally every day, multiple hours a day, phone off where we're just playing. Uh, and I will put the link to the school in the chat. It's called Be a Call. Um, but if you're not interested in, uh, in uh, you're not interested in French speaking, it probably doesn't make nearly as much sense for you, but it's an amazing school and I'm putting it here. Okay, so we don't live together. And we choose to go together. So we do family night, maybe two nights a week. We do date night, just us without kids, two nights a week. And we do date night at my place. We do family night at her place. But I will see my son every day, multiple hours a day with phone off. But I don't sleep there. Um, and it works very well for us. And so when in the month where I'm traveling, where he's in school, so October, November, sorry, November, December, uh, though not the, the holidays, because we're together then, um, I'll be in Turks to a rebel soap, maybe say January, February, but I'll come back to New York for a week. But we spent all of our vacations together. So again, non-traditional setup. It's also a setup that my partner loves, um, and that works for us. I, I focus on quality of time, not quantity of time. And I revise the right to change my mind about the setup in, in the future. But I've already changed it, right? I, I, I went from two month, two month, two month to making to maybe three weeks, one week, three weeks, one week, et cetera, to make sure that I'm uh, seeing my 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 kids uh, as often. Well, kids plural because I have a daughter coming February 15th. I congrats Not on for that. everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Not for everyone, but it works for me. And I have a dog as well, a, a, a white sh shepherd, uh, white German shepherd that travels with me everywhere. Actually, I'll, I'll give you a sense of how it works by putting a put a photo, a, a link to my year in review in here. Okay, let me go back to the questions. I don't know if anyone else has their hands raised. So in the meantime, I'll go back to this. How long did it take to donate everything? Root profs for thoughtful. Um, <laughs> it took very little time. But and I had to put zero thought into it. But when I went to my partner and I'm like, "Hey, I'm going to do this for the next six, whatever X period of time. I'm giving away everything away," and she was like, "Uh, you have like this thirteen thousand square foot house and full of stuff. Who are you donating to and how?" And she basically uh, uh, structured it for me. And so it ended up being thoughtful, but not. I was not very. But it and, and took very little time because she really coordinated it. And that was back in 2012. Um, and so we, you know, from the books to the, to that went to different schools or libraries to the furniture that went to either people we knew or people that needed it to the clothes that we don't, I mean, everything ended up being more thoughtful, but I have to admit, I took, I just made the executive decision, give everything away. And I didn't deal with the details and my partner did. And she's amazing. Da -da -da Love to connect if you can why remote assistant? Uh, why not local? Um, my remote assistant in the Philippines, I, I've, so I've never talked to her. I've never met her. Um, because I, my philosophy for hiring is 
I, I hired like multiple of the same on Upwork or elsewhere. And then I give them a, ta a partial task. I see how they do. And then I keep the best. And that's how I, I found someone in Bangladesh with like a dollar an hour to help with my photo albums. I found someone in like Russia to help with my video editing, et cetera. In this case, it's through a company called yourremoteassistant.com. I'll put the link as well here. And you be, basically, so if you're, if you, they send you one that based on your specs. And if you're not happy, you just change, get another one. That's why I never bothered to interview her. We've been working together at this point, at this point for a decade. Um, it's extraordinary because she's like a PhD in creative writing. She's way, way more skilled than any assistant I've ever had, including in person. Uh, she works exactly at whatever hours I want to work. So when I change time zone, she changes time zone as well. Um, she has access to everything from signatures to, uh, I mean, and she, I, I don't know. I find that she's been just more effective, harder working than anyone I've ever had in person, not to mention it's way cheaper. So we at our firm, we have 10 of them. Um, and the amount of stuff you can outsource is greater than you think. You know, if you like, if you have an online Shopify, they can do customer care. They can do, they can do, um, in, inventory management. Uh, I mean, you name it. In in my case, she will. She pretends to be me. Stays on the phone with T-Mobile or gets to doctor's appointments. I mean, you name it, and, and everything is done, and it's extraordinarily effective. Um, and I actually like the working through WhatsApp with her. Uh, I find it, I don't know. I, I, we have an office manager and I used to have an in-person, uh, assistant. I've had many of them, excluding very well-paid, super high-end. And maybe it, that didn't work nearly as well. I think for that type of role, I have an estate manager and my estate manager, actually, maybe I'll share my screen for a second. This is something I'm presenting tomorrow. Um, tick, tick, tick. one second, productivity. Let me minimize this. Dude, life hacks. I mean, probably this is non obvious, but I don't read any news whatsoever because, like, following the day by day of anything is actually not that relevant. So, yes, it's terrible and tragic what's happening in Gaza or Ukraine, but you know it's happening. And then taking a step back once every six months, understanding why, how, et cetera, is relevant, but like the day by day is completely irrelevant. You know, if, in COVID in the early days, it was all about like who violated the mandate. It, like there's no real information, right? Like what I want to know on COVID is, and it hasn't come out yet, is what would be the correct policy decisions to minimize health outcomes and economic and, and negative uh, impacts. And probably the answer is different in the early days where you have no vaccine than later when you do have a vaccine. But like that's an analysis that's interesting. The day-to-day -day news, it's all sensationalist BS. So I don't read news. I don't read newspapers. I don't read online news. I do nothing. I follow tech news, but like again, 10 minutes a day, Twitter and all that stuff, it's all negative all the time. They're capturing your attention and focusing on outrage. Um, I completely avoid it. That's what we're saying. So your remote assistant. The other very good one is Athena. That's the one, that's the company created by Jonathan Swenson from Thumbtack. You probably presented it here. Um, but she manages all of my agenda. So pending meetings, confirm meetings. This is what I get every day. Uh, then this is my agenda. If I know what it's about, there's no conversation. Uh, there's no detail. But if, if I don't know what it's about, she will put the detail of the context of why I'm having the conversation. That's for the next day. Uh, this is a typical day for me, by the way. So I, yeah, and it goes to like, and it'll include all the personal stuff. So yes, I'm giving a speech or whatever here, but then paddle, which is a form of tennis, if you want, 9 p.m. to 11, uh, everything is in there. If I'm going to do a meditation, go to the gym, everything is in my agenda every day, but she will manage invites for dinner. So for instance, the dinner I'm doing tonight, She'll book doctor's appointments. She'll wait in line on my behalf. She'll book meditations, gym. She organizes tennis. Um, she helps create posts. So she knows how to code as well. Um, I will write the blog post, but she will write. She will post it and she'll publish it and send the newsletter. Uh, and she manages the sub stack. So I do it in my WordPress, which I coded myself because I like doing that. Um, and I like writing, uh, but she will manage the sub stack on her own. She'll buy stuff for me, including on Amazon, because it's easier to just tell her. She'll sign everything, do the KYC, do government research, look for shows for me to attend, manage my... She created the design for my birthday invite. She manages the invite list. Uh, she manages all travel things. 
and then this is I iterate for album creation, you know, like slide 27, do this, this, uh, this photo makes me look fat, put a different photo, whatever. And then you have the photo, full album that I print and give to my parents. I do the same with someone else, by the way, I fan on Upwork for videos and I create a video every year and for every one of my major trips. And then for offline, I have an estate manager. So he's my main estate manager. He's a chef otherwise, but he drives, he cleans, car maintenance. If tonight for the dinner, he's normally cooking, but he's organizing the the whatever, like waiters. If it's a big party, he will bring he will bring chef, like everything offline, and he manages the other property managers. For each of my properties, I have a estate manager slash property manager, and that is also the chef. And they manage the staff and all the licensing. The, and, and I do sublets. For instance, this house here generates $4 million in revenues it, when I'm not there. And I am there four months a year. And they manage that. But they don't manage the reservations. They just manage the customer experience. I've, I've outsourced to an offline, the reservation manager. I created the site myself. And I moved all the traffic from Airbnb to direct reservations because that's what I'd like to do. But I have someone managing all the reservations. For my dog, I have a full-time dog trainer. And and who actually travels with me, gets all the documents, gets the vaccines. Now that's not forever. My dog is six month old, but for the first two years, um, and then for the nannies. So I find them on care.com and also on a French. Uh, I make sure that they speak French. They have a website group between themselves. I only take one for travel. Um, they all have a shared calendar app, and you know I need them to be able to speak French perfectly, can travel, can drive because they need to be able to drive the kid um, and everything's organized here. And then there's a nanny handbook that I created where everyone is following it. And so the, and there's like instructions of what needs to be done, et cetera. So <laughs> that, that model works. Um, what is- you, You've just wowed this entire group. I think everybody's jaw just dropped wherever they were with the level of uh, optimization. So thank you for sharing that. And there are quite a few requests if you're comfortable sharing the presentation after. So just to- Yeah, I will. I think I put the link. Yeah, I put the link to the presentation in Dropbox, I think somewhere. Uh, but it, it's going to be on my blog. I'm also pre going through this in detail tomorrow on my podcast at noon, but it'll be on my blog uh, shortly. Um, how do you manage all these companies and positions? Uh, oh, uh, I have a tool called Edda. But also more importantly, I have a back back. I have a big back office. So the tool we use, let me put it here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. It's edit.ca. Yeah, there. But and it's pretty cheap. Um, it if that allows us to manage deal flow. Not everyone needs it, but also we're thirty four in the firm, of which I mean obviously ten virtual assistants, but like. 13 or like back office, COO, CFO, legal, all that stuff. And I don't deal with any of that. Like I don't, life is too short to read legal documents. Life is too short to spend time doing admin work. So that's why I have a team around me to do all that shit that I hate. Um, someone wrote, uh, life is too short to, to deal with assholes. Completely agree. I do not tolerate jerks. If you're a brilliant founder, but you're an asshole, I will not back you, I will not fund you, I will not invest you, with you, I will not hire you if you're an amazing employee. Um, life is too short. Uh, <laughs> you only need to work with people that you love working with. Uh, let me go back to hire on the, let's see if I miss anything. Da, da, da. What is your most impactful mental performance practice? I do meditate. Um, I meditate, I have a, 20, well, 10 to 30 minute meditation practice every day. It is, I will write a blog post on how it is. I do four or five different things, uh, but they're very quick and efficient, but I'm very good at being present. Um, I have aphantasia, I cannot visualize. And so whatever I'm doing, I'm doing that and nothing else. I, I also have no notifications on, on anything at ever, at ever. My, I don't get email notifications, WhatsApp notifications. My phone never rings, never vibrates. Even a vibration takes you away from the present of what you're doing. It's like, oh, maybe there's something I should be looking at. You don't want to have FOMO. Whatever you're doing is that you've chosen to be doing and the best and most important thing you should be doing right now. And so I have no notifications whatsoever. And I'm very good at like going from context to context in the present. Multi humans cannot multitask. You monotask. You want to monotask effectively. So I will book time for emails. I will book time for whatever. And I will be present in that interaction, but I will not. But uh, you don't want to be doing many things. 
simultaneously meditation i like guided meditations uh not with not with uh, and i and i follow i don't have an app i have a, a few meditations i do a few breath work practices i do um i read a lot but i read for fun i don't read to be more productive i read mostly sci-fi uh but i read biographies i read i read 50 to 100 books a year um and but i read for fun i read one hour every day before bed which is why i ended up that school i think we discussed so how we're going to change when school changes how do you plan to school the child yeah i partly worth mentioning i'm a laissez-faire parent it's all about i want to encourage positive risk taking i'm not a helicopter parent i will i wanted them to learn to fail and learn to fail in a positive way and you need to fail repeatedly to succeed and i will encourage and reward work and effort over outcome uh and i've already worked with that pretty effectively uh and yeah, I'm the anti-helicopter parent, but I provide love and presence to the fact that my partner and I love each other. I mean, we've been together for 11 years and we're like life partners, even though it's a non-traditional relationship. We have an open relationship, which is very non-traditional. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't live together, but we're, it's, works for, it's not for everyone, but it works for us. Will you start more companies um, if I'm inspired to do it? So the problem for me starting a company at this point is the opportunity cost of my time is infinitely high. And I find that the, the the amount of leverage I have by working with founders and helping them and helping that many founders where my impact is actually meaningful, both either strategic advice and or helping them fundraise, which is my superpower, because I'm not leading, I, I share a deal with the, all the top VCs in the world, is massive. And as a result of that, it's very hard for me to justify being founder CEO versus doing this. But I like being founder CEO. So I've created this hybrid model where I'm executive chairman but not CEOs of companies that I like. Now, why do I do this, right? I could have retired 20 years ago. Um, actually, literally, exactly 20 years ago. Uh, I got my, I, I, I was 29 when I got my first ginormous exit. Um, it's purpose-driven. Oh, wait, I forgot to mention number four of the selection criteria, got distracted. Number four was like, does it mean my, my thesis is where the world is heading? Uh, and I have a very clear perspective on the future of work, the future of of of, of, of uh, mobility, the future of, of food, the future uh, of every category you can think of. And ultimately, it's purpose driven. Are we solving a big problem? And there are three problems that I care about: inequality of opportunity, which I'm mostly addressing through marketplaces because obviously they're deflationary. And by virtue of being deflationary, they're inclusionary. Number two, climate change. And I'm so optimistic that we're going to solve that. I mean, I'm seeing so many improvements, especially in solar and batteries that were, and many other things, right? Like, and this is a hundred different subsectors that I'm, 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 I'm beyond optimistic and happy to double click on that at some point. And number three, uh, as I said, the mental and, and, and physical well-being crisis. So why do I do these things? these things? I think the political system is broken. And it's structurally incapable, but it's broken, by the way, by design. I think is I think it's a feature. It's not a bug. I think it's the way the founding fathers uh, intended it to be. And people who think that the the politics are so partisan, et cetera, it's not worse than the past. I mean, we had a full blown civil war. We had like race riots. We had like uh, you know the desegregation movement, the anti war movement in the seventies. All these were actually just as acrimonious as what we have now. Just we have recency bias and we think now is worse. But actually, life is amazing right now, uh, better than it's ever been, even though our politics are broken, but they were always broken. And I suspect they will continue to be broken. And so because the political system is, is, is incapable of addressing these systems and these issues, it's up to us, doers, founders, investors, to go and solve the world's problems. And so, but I'm so optimistic. I mean, we are going to rise to the challenge of the 21st century and we are to create a, a a a better world of tomorrow for our children and for ourselves, a world of equality of opportunity and of plenty. Okay, with relationship with money, it's a means to an end. Uh, I don't chase more of it. Actually, it doesn't make any difference in my life. I more money is irrelevant. But I I so look, I do a lot in non for profit, right? I donate a lot of money. I, I fund the education of ten thousand kids K through twelve in the Dominican Republic. I but when I think of the impact I have, like the last company I built has 350 million unique visitors a month. We have 50 million people who make a living off the site. The impact of that for-profit entity on the world is dramatic. I mean, we are part of the fabric of society in Pakistan, right? Like these are, 
and, and this is true for all the investments I make. I don't invest because I think they're, I do think they're going to make money. Uh, and I like the fact that because they're profitable, they're scalable and sustainable, but they actually are all making a positive difference to the world. So the objective is not to make more money. As I said, I could have retired 20 years ago. The, the objective is solve the world's problems. And I use the vector of for-profit technology enterprises to do it because they're asset light, scalable, and can touch billions. Normal companies cannot touch billions of people that easily. Any thesis on how to bring back knowledge, truth to the masses? Um, well, truth, I don't know, but knowledge for sure, right? Like we are now in a in an extraordinary period uh, of democratization of information, right? If you want to have access, if you, if you want a, a, a class by the world Nobel Prize winner, it's on Coursera and it's free. If you're a K through 12 student, you want to improve in math, you can use the Can Migo, which is the AI by Can Academy. It's amazing. So if you're motivated in self-learning, it is easier to learn anything that it's ever been. YouTube videos on every topic, extraordinary. And if you want to start a startup, you know, when I started back in the 1990s, I needed like Oracle databases and Microsoft web servers and millions to just turn the lights on. I needed to build my own data center. Now you have no code, low code, AI, like, to, I could build you anything for sub 25K probably. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's it's leading to a massive democratization of startup creation and entrepreneurship that is beautiful. And um, so, yeah. Any advice for a founder starting a year off? Uh, I, I should have taken a year off. I'm The problem is that doesn't suit my personality particularly well. I've always been doing things. Um, so I went from thing to thing to thing. But yeah, be... Think through the things you love doing and go pursue them. Like, uh, look, I work hard, but I play hard. Like, I'm kite surfing, I'm, and I'm a fantastic kite surfer, heli skier. I, I, I'm still a competitive tennis player. I'm still like college level tennis player. I'm even you know, 49. I beat like beat up on the 25 year olds. I, I still, I, you know, I exercise. When I'm when I'm in Turks, for instance, I was averaging three and a half hours of sports a day every day, uh, to stay as fit as I can be. Um, and yeah, just do fun, do crazy things you've always wanted to do. Like go to, I, I go to burning. I take psychedelics once in a while. You know, I, I drop acid. It's amazing. Uh, go do a deep, go take ayahuasca and do a deep journey. I mean, like, I don't know, like there's so much to, to do and to be done and to live that it's a privilege to be alive. And it's a privilege to be alive in this, in this time period. And it's a privilege to be post exit. So money is a tool for freedom. Uh, it's not a, something to pursue more of, but to actually enjoy and use and use to make the world a better place. Fabrice, uh, I just want to say some, someone was mess messaging me directly on the side and said, I want to ask him if he takes psychedelics, but I don't know if it's appropriate. And then almost like on cue, <laughs> you answered the question uh, directly. So, so thank you for that. I want to- I, 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 am, I, am a, I am an open book. Nothing is secret. Uh, uh, and everything's transparent. Yeah. So at psychedelics, I've probably taken everyone in the world from 5-MeO-DMT to peyote to 2-CB to acid to psilocybin and whatever, uh, to ayahuasca. Um, I take them rarely and take them intentionally. So it's set, setting, intention, presence. I don't microdose. I find microdose, you open yourself up to whatever and then you're going to work and you have a stressful day i think that's idiotic i like to macro dose like real and either for fun like you know let's say one and one and a half gram of mushrooms if i'm burning man or like if i want to do a real deep meditative journey like I, I did a nine gram psilocybin journey um with music that was just like basically you know beautiful meditation for like seven hours a very introverted that's alone you don't do, i don't think do, um both are interesting i do it a couple times a year um I wouldn't recommend a huge amount of time because it takes time, it's distracting, whatever, but I think it's worth doing on a, you know, what, a couple times a year basis. So at Burning Man, I'll do acid for sure. Acid is like the one thing to do at Burning Man. I know uh, as long as you're willing to. Time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's your call. It's your call, your calendar. I think everybody's enjoying right, it. I'm, give I'm you a few more minutes. All right, let's do it. Uh, what do I think about AI and the future of AI? So, here, here's uh, so here's what's interesting. I think AI in 23 went to we were at like the top of the of the hype cycle. Uh, 
where clearly there was a a transformation in the quality of AI with with GPT three point five and and obviously now Bull four and Gemini and Bard et cetera. But and I do think it will ultimately transform society in a more meaningful way than we can imagine today. But I also think it's going to take a lot longer than people think it's going to take. And so that's why I think we're at the top of the hype cycle. And there's going to be the period of disillusionment in the next five years. Because before, you know, when do we think governments will really integrate AI for in improving it, its operating capacity or even large enterprise, right? Like if you're a health medical claims processor, you, the hallucination problem is real. And like, you don't want to have like, you, you want you want to you, and you you don't want to be liable for for having bad results. And so, while I suspect in twenty years it'll be so transformative, we won't even be able to recognize a lot of things the way we work and a lot of things in humanity. In the next five years, I think it's going to be the period of like disappointment. So what I've been and because AI has been so overvalued as an investment category in businesses with no business model, no moats, and no differentiation. I shied away from investing in AI other than a few specific vertical applications with proprietary data um, in, in, in reasonable valuations, but they've been far and few between. But everything we're doing these is, is AI. Everyone's using AI, right? Like every company is using it for customer care and to be better in programming. I use it every day, right? Like what well, I, I'm not a great coder anymore. So when I'm coding my blog and I forget some functions, I just ask a GPT, hey, I want to do this. What's the correct code? Now, don't ask you to code an entire thing that it sucks at that, but like specific functions, very easy. Uh, if your investment's done over time, when you compare first time founders to second time, um, same average IRR, second time founders who, well, I can actually wait. So, second time founders are two, fall in two buckets. Second time founders have been very successful the first time, often become more purposeful and mission driven the second time. Uh, and it leads to both better outcomes and worse outcomes, meaning more companies fail because they're taking more risks. And when they succeed, they succeed bigger. By their blended IR is the same. Second time founders who failed the first time on average have done better um, than, than, than both than just general founders and the second time founders who've been successful the first time because they're hungry and have a point to prove if, if they've learned the lesson of why they failed. So if they learn that, okay, oh, I spent too much money, I raised too much money, I have too high price, whatever, whatever it was they need to learn uh, or they didn't focus enough product market fit or union economics, then it's fine. Who's the most impressive uh, founder that, that you've ever backed? Uh, uh, I'm not sure there's the most impressive founder, but there was a few very impressive founder and founders, and some some who failed, some who haven't failed. So, for instance, Alex Garden, who built Zoom Pizza, which failed completely, he, he is so eloquent and such an amazing salesperson and very impressive. Ryan from Flexport is extraordinary. He's a machine and visionary. He's amazing. So there are many many amazing people out there. Um, I don't think there's one that's like oh, you know, like pe people. Yeah, there, there's like, let's say, oh yeah, Brett Attic, he's extraordinary. So Brett, Brett built Vettery, a, uh, which was a labor marketplace, which we sold for like 100 million at Echo. Then he went on to build uh, Archer, which is an electric vertical takeoff company, which he, which he took public. And now he's building Figure. Figure is made, creating these humanoid robots who replace humans in warehouses. And, and the problems he's solving to do that are so extraordinary. I guess I could put an Elon in the category. I was an early investor in, uh, let me put the figure link in here. Um, I don't remember the, if, if he's in the, the community or not, but his um, uh, it was twice shared as like SPVs to invest and at least a dozen founders from the group invested. There was a recording of like his pitch for it. I have sent that recording that he did for like fundraising to dozens right, from of exited repeat founders. Yeah. But, yeah. About yeah. like he's just it was the best pitch I've ever seen in my entire life. He's just yeah. So I think so, Brett, Brett is up there. Good. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing founder. Uh, obviously, I backed Elon back in the day. I invested in 2007 in SpaceX. Uh, <laughs> uh, still an investor. I didn't sell uh, any of my shares. I'm not selling any of my shares. Um, yeah. Who do you look up to and why? Um, I guess historical role models. Octavian or Augustus, who basically single-handedly created the Roman Empire and 
brought an end to the civil war in 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 in, in Rome and created the basis for 500 years of Pax Romana and a significantly improved livelihood for humanity writ large for 500 years. I mean, at least the first two, 300 of that. Um, Alexander Hamilton, and not even American, but ultimately created the, you know, re kind of convinced and forced the U.S. to repay his debt, which created the treasury and put the U.S. on a path to becoming the world dominant superpower that it is today. It would have been funnily different if... Um, he had lost uh, the, the the these arguments back in the day, um, so you know, and, and it depends. And then it, it's like just geniuses in different forms, like Da Vinci. Even though he's, we know so much less of him, that you know, none of the biographies are super compelling. Um, but yeah, I, I obviously am a fan of uh, Walter Isaacson and and Rod Chernow biographies and, and the people that they cover. What about anybody current currently alive? You know, I think someone who gets doesn't get enough credit. Well, two people. Well, Deng Xiaoping he passed not that long ago, but Deng Xiaoping, who basically transformed China from a communist state to a thriving and, and enriched a billion people in the making, right? Like, change, it, it, decrease extreme poverty, poverty significantly uh, by transforming China into a capitalist country. Now, it, sadly, his legacy is being undone by Xi Jinping. So, if I, if someone like Deng Xiaoping was in power in China today, I think China would actually be on track to become the wealthiest country in the world, but also I think it would be an ally of the U.S. Sadly, we have a, you know, um, counter, uh, we have a Mao descendant uh, in Xi Jinping who cares more about nationalistic power and, and his own personal power than he does about the well-being of his people. And that is a lot of, and so I think no, China is no longer going to be the dominant superpower of the 21st century, given the choices they're making right now. And is and sadly, and we have a Cold War II, not only brewing, but are actually active right now. So Deng Xiaoping would have been that uh, in, the, in the recent decades. Bill Gates doesn't get enough credit either. Um, I think both for the role he played in the democratization of technology, you know, a PC in every home, which has been massively deflationary and inclusionary as well. And actually the role he's playing right now is not-for-profit initiatives. Um, yeah. What's the best life decision you've made? Uh, what are the examples of wrong decisions? I'll start there. Uh, I try. I wanted to build an upgrade community um, where I could where I could let founders come and build. You know, with no real business model. Uh, artists come and create, and 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 spiritual leaders come and lead, and maybe do it. If, and if it got too busy do it maybe through applications, you know, where I see sell. Um, and I, I bought a couple hundred acres of land in Belize. And well, first I got, I bought hundreds of thousands of acres in, in, in Belize, so several percent of the country. Then we realized that in a banana Republic, they can just take it away. What do you think you own? You don't necessarily own and they can take it away from you. So then I'm like, Oh, I'm going to this much safer, more developed country, Dominican Republic. But I didn't go in Punta Cana, Casa de Campo. I went in Cabarete, which because I like to kite. And I bought a couple hundred acres of land and turns out that it was still too banana republic -y. I did that in 2013 to 2019, but everyone from the mayor to the minister of environment, tourism, they all wanted bribes, which I, and I was not willing to bribe them because I told them my, my time allocate, I could, I don't want to be a real estate developer. I want to be, a, I want to be using my time to the betterment of humanity through harnessing the deflation power of tech. And I'm not going to play the political game. Either you realize that what I'm doing is amazing for you and your country, and you'd let me do it legally, or I'm not playing. And I guess they decided not to let me play. And so even though I had a $100 million development that I wanted to do in the Dominican Republic, where I, I and I bought this one mile of beach friend, hundreds of acres of land, I never got to get it off the ground because of uh, I never got all the licensing because they, I didn't want to bribe anyone. And it ultimately became started to become dangerous. I mean, not only did all my guests catch Zika, Chinkagunia, Dengue, et cetera, uh, attempted rapes, many burglaries. Uh, I got full on attacked by people with shotguns. There was a sh blowout shootout in my garden. Um, the, and, and because it's, it was, I mean, it's beautiful. It's raw, it's authentic. It's like the average GDP there is like, you know, 2000 a year, but my family hated it. They felt it was dangerous. And I guess I, I, 
because I like going at these upgrade places where I'm like, you know, with not very poor countries and I don't have any, I don't have any displays of wealth on me. I don't appear where, you know, if you see me there, I'm like shorts and t shorts and t-shirt. I don't have anything. I don't have a watch. I don't have, so uh, it never occurred to me, but that was a mistake. It took six years. And then I was like, okay, after I, after we got it out, oh, they murdered my, they, they kid my dog. I mean, it was a disaster. So eventually I left, I moved to Turks and Caicos, which is now my like family retreat. Uh, and I should have done that way, way faster. Should not have waited six years. Uh, lesson learned, best decisions, you know, the best decisions never came immediately. Um, it's always through iteration that I ended up finding what was right for me, but best decisions, for, you know, just be true and authentic to yourself and who you are and what you want and, and pursue that. Like, uh, um, and, and whenever I've done that, it, it's always paid off. I think I need to end it there. I'm meeting in very near and I need to get there, <laughs> but, uh, this was super fun. This was amazing. I am, uh, 